How many of you have heard that saying, it is what it is? In this episode, we're going to find out why that saying simply won't cut it in the academic study of religion. I'm Dr. Richard Newton, and this is your introduction to religious studies, and it's coming up right now. Now, if you look throughout history at all the ways that the term religion has been used and all the different phenomena classified under the rubric of religion, you quickly find out that it's very difficult to define religion. We in the academic study of religion know that defining religion is easier said than done. Now, it's tempting to rely upon the convenience of something called the family resemblance model. And the family resemblance model is a statement or a framework in which we understand that all things classified as religious bear some similar general commonalities that allow us to say that they are related to each other. For instance, all religions believe in God. All religions believe in kindness. All religions hold community to be important. Now, there's a level at which some of these things may be true. But there are also places, as soon as you start to look closely at all these different phenomena, in which they're not true. For instance, I've talked in the past about how there are plenty of people who would identify as Buddhists, which many people call a religion, who don't believe in God, who don't find the supernatural important or even a thing. There are numerous people in the United States who identify as Jews, but many of them do not believe in God or think of God as being all that important to what defines them as Jewish. As much as we talk about religion being a communal thing, for many people, religion is a solitary individual matter. So when we start looking at the, where the rubber meets the road, defining religion according to these resemblances actually says a lot more about us as observers and what we hold to be important or crucial than it does about the things that we are describing. Scholar of religion Timothy Fitzgerald says that when people use the family resemblance model to examine religion, it actually betrays what those people see as essential in the study of religion. It belies essentialism, an ideology in which we say this is what is most important and those things that don't have that characteristic aren't as pertinent to our observations. Now that might be okay when just talking about what we're seeing, but as we've learned in previous chapters, the study of religion and what we classify as religion is certainly political. It has things that are attached to it with great stakes. Who matters, who doesn't, who's a value, who isn't, who's civilized, who's primitive, as E.E. E. Evans Pritchard has told us. As scholars of religion, we've got to do better in being careful, precise, and redescribing the things that we are studying, right? A scholar's job is to redescribe what others would take for granted. So when we go about studying religion in this class and in this enterprise we call religious studies, we want to look at how religion functions. Rather than practicing essentialism, we're going to practice functionalism. We want to understand how religion works in the world. In the academic study of religion, we practice what's called a hermeneutics of suspicion. Hermeneutics is just a fancy word derived from the Greek term for interpretation or message. To help rem remember the term, I like to think of Hermes, the messenger god, who brings messages from one party to another. Because as scholars, our job is to bring a message to our audience. But our message, Russell McCutcheon, scholar of religion, says, is not an answer about the essential thing that we should take for granted um, about a religion, that religions are about this one single thing. They believe in this one single thing. He says, our job as scholars of religion is to bring questions about social systems and the worlds that we take for granted. So a hermeneutics of suspicion is the primary methodology we use to examine this thing, these things that people classify as religious. Now in doing this, we need to practice a sort of methodological atheism where no question is off the table. There's nothing that is too holy, too special, too sacred for us to not raise questions about. But don't get it twisted. We're not in the business of naming whether there is or isn't a God, or whether a religion is right or wrong. In fact, we don't really care about that question so much in the academic study of religion. Our interest is in what people are doing with religion, right? We're functionalists, not essentialists. 
For that reason, some people prefer the term methodological agnosticism, right, indifferent to the notion of what one holds to be true or not true, um, than methodological atheism. So methodological atheism, methodological agnosticism, either term can be used in the confines of our conversation about religion. But remember that we're here to study how religion functions in the world as part of culture. So what does this mean in practical terms for the study of religion? I think the best way to think about this is through a thought experiment. So take notes with me and follow along, and I think you'll be able to see how we can put the hermeneutics of suspicion and our functionalism to work. So let's say you're going about studying religion. You're watching someone do what you or someone else has classified to be religious. Let's say you say they're reading their Bible. Let's say you see them um, going into a synagogue. Maybe they are um, going on a pilgrimage. I don't know. Whatever you want to say they're doing, uh, that is religion. They're going to a Metallica concert, okay? If that's religion for you, fine. But you're watching them do whatever it is that they're going to do, and you want to see, as a scholar of religion, what can you observe about them and what can you say about them? Given that scenario, can you just go up to them and say, hey, what are you doing? And that's the be-all, end-all understanding you have about religion? I don't think so. Because what they say is useful, right? It is data for us. It's also not the end point of what we want to know as scholars of religion. Think about it this way. If a doctor asks a patient what's wrong, and the patient says, well, I'm not feeling well, I'm hot, does the doctor say, okay, you have a case of the hots? You're sick. No, the doctor is going to ask a lot of questions about, well, what does that mean? What does that look like? How does that work? And from that data, they're going to use that to ascertain or redescribe what is going on with the patient. Similarly, as scholars of religion, we're not just asking our object of study what they think, what they're doing, what they're saying. We're taking that data and using it to make sense of how what they're doing, what they're saying, functions in society. What does that mean in terms of the study of religion and methodological atheism and hermeneutics of suspicion? That inside the circle, we have our object of study, our data. But we, the scholars of religion, are outside the circle, watching what's going on inside the circle. So inside the circle is the group of people being designated as religious or doing religion, okay? The scholar of religion is going to redescribe from the outside what this thing is that the people inside the circle are doing. That means the insider is the one doing religion. They are our data. The outsider is the observer of the person doing religion. They are the scholar. So as scholars of religion practicing methodological atheism or methodological agnosticism, we're not in the business of judging whether the insider is right or wrong about what they're doing. What we want to do as the outsider is re-describe what the insider is doing. And our hermeneutics of suspicion is the standpoint we take in which we ask and raise all manner of questions about the insider so we can better understand the human. That's what it means to study religion. You might think this is all really academic, but I think you'll see the usefulness as I relay to you a case study that's actually from my own life. When I was in graduate school studying religion, I had a good friend who was from Saudi Arabia named Karim. And Karim, I don't think he'd mind me telling you this story, he and I would go to sports bars to watch sporting events. UFC, basketball, you name it. And I recall watching a sporting event 
and seeing him uh, a little bit further down at the bar ordering a pitcher of beer. Now, Karim from Saudi Arabia drinking beer at a sports bar may not seem out of place, except if I add in the detail that he comes from, of course, as you may already see where I'm going here, a Muslim country. And he has a Muslim name, right? So I was taken aback as a scholar of religion that this guy would be downing a pitcher of beer. And I asked him about this and I said, you know, isn't this forbidden in your religious tradition? And he said, sure, but I'm not that devout. And I said, okay, fair enough. But let's fast forward a month. And in this month, uh, according to Muslim reckoning, it was the month of Ramadan, which is a season noted in this religious tradition in which Muslims will often make a pilgrimage to the holiest city of Mecca. And those Muslims who are not on the pilgrimage will commemorate the journey of those who are on the pilgrimage by taking part in a fast where from sunup to sundown, they won't eat. Now, Karim at the sports bar did not drink and did not eat during one sporting event during Ramadan. And I looked over and asked him about this. And I was like, why aren't you eating? And why aren't you drinking? And he says, well, it's Ramadan. I said, yeah, but you drink. And he's like, but it's Ramadan. It's, it's a special time. And I said, that's really interesting because you said you weren't that devout. And he says, you got to understand, back home, everyone is not eating. Everyone is not drinking. Everyone is doing this one thing together that brings us together. It makes us who we are. And that's just part of who I am. And he said he wasn't that devout of a Muslim, but that's a really profound statement about who he is and what he's doing and how this thing called Islam functions for him in his community and in the community from which he is a part. Now, if I didn't practice a hermeneutic of suspicion, if I maintained a sort of essentialist understanding of Islam in which Muslims can't drink or they're not really Muslims, then I would completely miss out upon the com social complexities and cultural ramifications of how Karim understands what it means to be a Muslim. I'll end our discussion this way. Anthropologist Mary Douglas said that dirt is simply matter out of place. That statement, from a functionalist perspective, reminds us to move beyond essentialist understandings of the things that we observe just being how they are. It is what it is. As scholars, our job is to push to the question of how did this become the way we perceive it? Why do people perceive this this way? And why do other perce people perceive it that way? Why are the distinctions that we make about the world different, whether you're on the inside or the, on the outside? As scholars of religion, we're going to be gaining tools in order to pursue those questions further, and we're going to look at a whole range of data to help us better understand how human beings make sense of the world around them.